Okay, we'll go ahead and get started, everybody. Welcome to um, the Volunteer Impact in CCS Morocco Cross-Cultural Solutions webinar. Um, we hold webinars quite frequently um, on different topics that we're hearing questions about from prospective volunteers, um, as well as uh, just, you know, we'd love to share more, more information about. Um, so uh, really welcome to this. It's a great, engaging way, hopefully, to hear about um, our programs and different topics. Um, we have all of the recordings of the webinars um, on our website. Uh, so after today, um, we'll be posting this webinar in a few days. Um, but you can see all of the um, past webinars on different countries and different topics um, on our website. So definitely let us know if you'd like the link for that. Um, it's just at the bottom of our regular CCS homepage, there's a link for webinars. Um, and next week, we're actually having another webinar on June 20th. Um, it's at 3.30 Eastern Time, and uh, the topic will be Working with People Affected by HIV and AIDS, so a really um, engaging topic as well. Um, so I just wanted to talk through the format before we get started. Um, as you might notice, all of your phones are on mute, um, and that's just so we don't have um, any background noise if anybody is somewhere windy. Um, but there's a chat feature where you can ask questions, um, and I'll actually be on the chat feature. Um, and so. Um, so you can see that on your screen where you can pose a question and I can either answer it um, to you directly or we can take it to the whole group and talk through it over, over the phone if it's something I think um, everybody else might be interested in. Um, and do know that um, after the session we're more than happy to talk with you personally about your interests or questions um, or if you want to learn more about any other parts of CCS, we definitely would love to engage with you on that. Um, so with that, I think we'll take it away um, doing some introductions. Um, my name is Claire Boyce. Um, I'm on the bottom right-hand side. I actually just got back from Morocco um, two weeks ago, I think it was. So I am fresh off the program and uh, originally started as a CCS volunteer as well. I volunteered in Costa Rica for eight weeks, and I've also been on our program in Guatemala. And what's really exciting to see is that they're all so different, so unique, and it's just so fun to learn about a new culture through volunteering abroad. So I hope that uh, you find um, the programs as fascinating as I do. I have a hard time picking up where I want to go next. So Morocco, I couldn't more highly recommend. Um, and Pete is here as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Pete Bryan. I'm a program advisor for Cross Cultural Solutions, and I volunteered in Morocco last October. Uh, I am the guy in the yellow shirt on the top right with the blue scarf on my head, and I am standing next to my wife, and we actually did this program for our honeymoon, so we volunteered for a week, and then we traveled around Morocco for a week as well, so definitely happy to be here and uh, answer all your guys' questions and everything, give you guys a better idea of what's going on in uh, Morocco, uh, so next I want to just go over our agenda real quick. Uh, first bullet point is introductions. We got that out of the way. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about CCS as a whole, uh, some fun facts about uh, Morocco and Rabat specifically, uh, the volunteer work that we do there, and then break down all the details for you, uh, the home base, the staff, the different culture and learning activities you're going to do, free time activities. Uh, then at the end, if we have time, if Claire and I don't talk your ears off, we'll have a Q&A session and go over next steps. And also keep in mind, like Claire already mentioned, if you have any questions right now, you can always uh, chat those to Claire. Uh, she can either answer right away, or we'll just save them for the Q&A session uh, at the end. And uh, so then uh, we can just move forward from there. Perfect. OK. So uh, first slide is uh, about CCS, I just want to talk a little bit about our approach to, to volunteer work. Uh, basically, uh, it's important that we respect local expertise and community development. Uh, we're always deferring to the expertise of local people. Kind of how it works is we have partnerships with uh, in-country initiatives. Uh, CCS doesn't go to Morocco, for example, and open up the CCS school. Uh, instead, what we do is we partner with existing schools that are uh, led and driven by Moroccans, because no one knows Morocco better than Moroccans. So they're the experts on their community, and we partner with them. And uh, we partner with a wide variety of different types of volunteer placements. So where you come in is uh, you tell us more about your background and the type of volunteer work you're interested in, 
and uh, we use that information to help find a good placement uh, for you. Uh, the people making those decisions and making all the partnerships in the community is our in-country staff. And our in-country staff is, uh, we'll get into more detail about them later, but they're one of the highlights of our program. They're all local people from the community. Uh, it's not me leading you in Morocco. I wish, but, uh, but I'm not Moroccan, so I can't be part of the in-country staff. Uh, so they're there 24-7 uh, to help you when you're in country, but also fostering all these relationships and finding all these volunteer placements for you. Uh, a big part of what we do is cultural immersion. Uh, that's why our home bases are located in residential communities. We don't want our volunteers in a hotel in a really touristy part of town. That's not what we want to do. Uh, so we're going to talk to you more about the home base to give you guys a better feel of what that's going to be like. Uh, it's really important that we have different culture and learning activities. These cultures and these places you're going have so much to offer. So to just focus on volunteer work would, wouldn't give you the whole context of what's going on. So we want you to learn everything from uh, traditions, food, language, we want you to know all that type of stuff. And then lastly, we're fostering relationships. So at your volunteer placements, in the communities, with your uh, uh, language lessons, whoever's teaching you, you know, just there's so much different stuff going on and you just make so many friends and build so many relationships for the future. And then lastly uh, is flexibility. We're in country year round. We have start dates all year. So uh, for people who want to go on their summer break, we have dates for you. If uh, you're a retiree and you're more flexible, we have dates for you. If you want to celebrate your birthday or, uh, for example, I went on my honeymoon there, there's dates year-round. So we want to be flexible because we understand that uh, you can't just take off whenever we ask you to. So uh, we offer that flexibility. Uh, so we have different program types in 12 countries uh, all around the year, anywhere between 1 to 12 weeks. Okay, so moving on about Morocco. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you guys uh, an overview um, about a country that is so fascinating to me. Um, I had been there previously on just a one-day trip from Spain, so I got just the flavor. And um, since then, I've been just really um, interested in learning more and learning more about Moroccans. Um, so it's a very complex and nuanced country, um, very diverse geographically. Um, you will see, if you travel throughout the country, you'll see deserts, agricultural areas that are really fertile. You'll see Roman ruins. You'll see coastline and beaches. Um, the Atlas Mountains are huge. I never realized how huge they are until I'm on a bus going across them. Um, there's beautiful modern cities and also obviously very rural areas. So it's a really fascinating place to travel to and learn about um, you know, what makes Morocco unique from its neighbors and from um, North Africa and the rest of the continent as well. Um, it's also a very diverse um, country culturally. Um, there's people of different um, uh, regions of origin in Morocco. Um, there's also a lot of immigrants in Morocco, which was really new information to me. Um, it's a bridge to Europe for a lot of um, Africans um, and North Africans um, who are trying to find a better life for themselves. So in Morocco, you'll see people from all around the world, and um, it's a really, again, fascinating place. Um, and what CCS is all about is build, building bridges and understanding across cultures. So um, as most people are aware, um, there's lots of stereotypes in the world today, especially following um, September 11, 2011, um, in both, sorry, 2001, yes. <laughs> my goodness, too many 11s, um, in both the U.S. and in the Arab world um, about other cultures. So this is really your opportunity to meet real people, um, gain a real understanding of Morocco and the culture there and, and get a slice of the pie of North Africa um, and be an ambassador of your country and culture. So I think that's unique about the Morocco program um, and kind of current events um, is really you have the opportunity to be, um, you know, representative of and, and the responsibility to be a representative of your culture, um, you know, no matter where you're coming from, if you're from Europe or um, from North America um, or anywhere else. So I think that's a really fun fun thing about traveling to Morocco and, and having those conversations with people while you're traveling. Yeah. Another fun thing, if you look at the slide, the top right picture is uh, the Moroccan mint tea, which is everywhere. And it's really mm -hmm. good. I, I don't like tea that much, uh, but oh, it's so good. Uh, 
cinnamon tea, and then they put a bunch of sugar, like a ton of sugar in it. So much sugar. I thought I wouldn't like it because it was so sugary, and I don't like sugary sweet tea usually, but it's so good. Even on a hot day, a hot glass of tea is really nice. And it's everywhere. Uh, I thought it was just during our orientation, they told us about it. They poured us a couple cups. So I thought, okay, whatever. Uh, but it is everywhere, this tea. Uh, and it's one of the, one of the highlights uh, of your trip, definitely. Um, about CCS in Rabat. Uh, Rabat is a bustling, vibrant capital city. It's a large city. Um, a lot of different people there. You have a lot of uh, professionals there. You have a lot of families there. There's big universities there. There's a lot of college students there. Uh, since it's a capital city, you have a lot of foreign diplomats there. So there's a ton going on. So I thought it was a really interesting place. I was really glad uh, that we got to spend time in Rabat. Um, it's one of our newer programs. Uh, it's opened in 2007, but even though it's new, it's already had over 1,200 volunteers. So that's, that's a lot. So basically we opened it, and it's been extremely pop popular <laughs> since we opened. So uh, definitely one of the ones where you want to plan it out, because some of our dates for it do fill up, because it is so popular. Um, programs available, we have our Inside Abroad program, which is one week long. Uh, we have our volunteer abroad program, which is our flagship program. Most people will do that. That's between two to 12 weeks. And then we have an intern abroad program, uh, which is four to five weeks. And, uh, Claire, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. The uh, focus is social services for the intern abroad program. And if you see the picture on the bottom right hand side of the screen, that's Mohammed, our country director, talking to one of the interns about what she was planning on um, getting um, her research, or doing her research topic on. And in Morocco, the internship is really based on um, kind of a research or reflection topic that you'd really like to dig into while you're there. So um, you'll have set your own learning objectives in the social services sector. So one person was looking at um, street children and um, that phenomena of um, you know children that are, are begging with their families um, and kind of what the community is doing to try to um, provide those children and families with services and, and better education. Um, another intern was focusing on um, the uh, kind of housework um, uh, job, I would say, that um, young girls are doing um, in some of the more wealthy families. And um, so uh, kind of another um, issue related to child labor. Um, so and it's really anything you want to, you know, if you're fascinated by women in Morocco or you want to learn more about um, comparing the healthcare system, you know, that's all a part of social services. So, um, you know, definitely if you have a, a topic in mind that you want to listen or want to study while you're there, it's something that we can, um, you know, definitely talk to you about whether that would be a good fit for the Morocco intern program. Um, and uh, it's really uh, very similar to the volunteer program in that you're still volunteering in the community, you're still doing the cultural immersion activities. But the research topic is kind of an added layer. It's really great for people who have a, um, you know, kind of want that academic structure, or maybe are trying to get academic credit through their school. Um, so if you're in that in that boat, definitely talk to a program advisor um, after this presentation. And just a couple other things I wanted to mention about Rabat that I thought was really excellent for a program site uh, is that it's right on the coast. So um, you have the ocean right there. It's Beautiful. Um, you're, you know, have that opportunity to, you know, walk along the beach and go to cafes that overlook the ocean and rivers. Um, and the weather, therefore, is really nice and temperate. It actually is compared to California weather. So when you think of Morocco, you know, don't think it's all desert. <laughs> There's definitely opportunity to have really mild temperatures. I was there in May, and it was just starting to get into the 80s, which is similar. Um, to New York weather right now where we are. So uh, really comfortable. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, you were there in November, Pete. It was kind of chilly. Yeah, it was actually, yeah. Uh, they got a little bit of a cold spell. So for me, it was a little bit chilly. But luckily, uh, the program site specialist, Sharon, she told us ahead of time. So I was pretty prepared. I brought some warm clothes. Where a lot of people don't think that. They think northern Africa, they think Sahara Desert, you know, t-shirts and shorts. But definitely, we needed some long clothes. Um, another thing that people don't necessarily think about is Morocco, uh, people who speak Arabic, they also speak a lot of French. So if you have any skills in French or if you want to practice your French or if you took it in high school and 
uh, it may be rusty, but it's going to be really useful. So that was something that stood out to me too. Is there's a bunch of people all over the country speaking French, so that's really a useful skill to have. Absolutely, yeah. I broke out my high school and college French, and it was very handy. <laughs> And I don't speak Arabic or French, so it didn't matter. <laughs> you were fine. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, TCS experience. Uh, we kind of break it down a little bit. We're going to talk about cultural and learning activities, the volunteer work, uh, free time, and then the home base where everyone's going to be staying. So our first slide is the most important aspect of cross-cultural solutions is our, is our volunteer work. Uh, so uh, we kind of break it up into different categories. The first category I'm going to talk about is caregiving. Uh, so, uh, caregiving, uh, the two biggest types of places where that fall under this category are the children's hospital and uh, the orphanage for children with special needs. Uh, these types of placements is all about your energy, planning activities, really engaging the kids. Uh, I volunteered at the children's hospital. Uh, if you remember from our introduction slide, I've been to a bunch of different programs all over the world, and I think the children's hospital was the most fun placement I ever had. Because that's all it was about was fun. Because uh, these kids at the hospital, you know, they're away from their friends, they're away from school, they're away from most of their family, and they're in this hospital all day. So the staff, they ask the volunteers to come in and just have fun. Uh, I've had places before at like schools and daycares, and you have to plan fun activities, but make sure they're educational. Where at the children's hospital, they're like, yeah, don't worry about it, just have fun. So uh, I loved it, and you could just see the the difference you're making on the kids' faces. They were so excited when you came. And, uh, you know, they had to get checked out by the doctor first to tell them that they were well enough to play that day, and they'd come run into the room. And uh, We had a bunch of different supplies, and different arts and crafts activities, and ball games and stuff we'd play. And, uh, I'm actually in the center of the slide. Uh, I'm kind of incognito. If you look at the center picture of the group posing, I am the Ninja Turtle on the right. <laughs> I think I'm Michelangelo there, so we made some math different activities there. That was an incredible amount of fun. Uh, the orphanage placement, I actually visited. Claire, you did visit that. Yeah, one. yeah. I got to spend a morning there, and it's such a special placement. You really make a big difference. Our volunteers make a huge difference there. Um, the biggest thing that our volunteers do is they help the nurses who are caring for about 25 kids in the special needs section of, of this orphanage um, with kind of the, the daily routine. So, you know, bathing, feeding, dressing in the morning. Um, and so if you if you want to be really hands-on and you know, do something a little bit more physical, it's a great placement for that because you know you're really working with your hands with your, you know, helping these kids every morning get ready for their day. And then um, you also make, I mean, just a huge impact on these kids because if our volunteers aren't there, there's nobody to take them out into the courtyard um, for the second part of the morning um, or, you know, give people one-on-one -on -one attention. You know, there's kids very little that um, uh, don't have a lot of mobility, and there's kids older that, you know, have really um, you know, a lot of uh, desire to have conversations with you and, and be engaging with you. So um, definitely every day our volunteers make a huge impact there with that kind of one-on-one -on -one attention. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Uh, now more about teaching placements. Yeah, yeah. And I got to visit the other teaching placements as well. So um, it's a really inspiring place. Um, if you're interested in teaching English, um, it's a fantastic um, place to volunteer. Uh, we work with um, schools um, as well as grassroots organizations. Um, so uh, you might be teaching a classroom of preschoolers some basic um, English and kind of inspiring them to be interested in learning, which is what the, the volunteer in the middle of the screen is doing. Um, or you might be in one of the grassroots organizations working with um, young adults um, or even older adult professionals who are trying to equip themselves with more skills. Um, I visited one of the grassroots organizations, the first teaching placement I visited, and I was like, I'm not one of those people that's very good at teaching, and I would, would be very nervous, but after going to that placement, I was so inspired. I would want to be a good teacher at that placement because people are just sponges. They have so many goals about what they'd like to do um, with their new skills and, you know, open a business or go into tourism or there's a big unemployment issue in Morocco, and so um, people are really eager to you know, be as competitive as they can um, with their, their resume and skill set. So 
really cool place. And one of the grassroots organizations is actually a women's group. Um, and so if you're interested in you know, meeting a lot of local women, this is a great place to do that and obviously helping them with their career development. Um, and uh, what else is I going to say about, about that? Oh, um, there's both opportunities to teach beginners. Um, so people who are just starting to lay that foundation, whether they're kids or adults, um, and also with more advanced people uh, or more advanced English speakers. So um, that was really cool too, working with more advanced English speakers because you can have um, you know practice vocabulary and have a more advanced conversation about hey, what do you think about this environmental issue or what do you think about um, you know the internet or, or some topic that you're interested in exploring. Um, people really want to practice those different vocabularies and so you can kind of have that uh, local insight through your volunteer work too. Did you visit the school for uh, refugees? Uh, it's actually, a, yeah, it's a grassroots organization yeah. that teaches, yeah, refugees. Um, so, yeah, at that um, a place where people are, um, you know, learning English as young adults, often they are, um, you know, from other sub-Saharan African countries. So, um, again, just an opportunity to make an impact on somebody's journey through, you know, trying to be successful in their life. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in refugee issues, Morocco is a really cool place to you know, meet people and also learn about that issue. I got to visit that uh, oh, organization did? for a day. Okay. And yeah, they definitely had advanced and beginner. And at the time, there was only one volunteer there, and so the class all had to be together. Uh -huh. And if anyone has taught before knows, that's not a recipe for for a, an effective class. So you had advanced people who were frustrated that the class was being slowed down by the people who were just beginning, or then you'd have some beginners who were frustrated because they they couldn't follow when the advanced mm -hmm. people would talk. So that's the type of place where we need more volunteers. We need to have two or three people there so we can split up the classes so people can go into the level that's more appropriate for them. And then it's just more efficient and just a better experience for everyone. But yeah. And that one was cool. There's students from all over Africa in, in the classroom. So that's part of the fun. It's like, oh, where are you from? How did you get here? Well, you know, And then yeah, they talk about, yeah, I'm going to learn English. I'm going to get a job doing this. I'm going to open up a cafe. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, that was really cool. We're so eager. And yeah, some of the words I heard tossed around after people's first feedback meeting of their first week of volunteering, um, it was really cool to see everybody kind of um, feeling that it was rewarding and challenging, and somebody said perspective altering, which I thought was a really neat word. And this is after just the first couple days. Um, Eye-opening, surprising in a good way, fun. So it's, it's just a great set of partners to work with, and as Pete said, earlier about the way we place you in your volunteer work, you know, we're going to want to know what you're passionate about and also be putting you into something that the community really needs. So you can feel really confident in that. Yeah. So that basically wraps up uh, the placement type. So again, just to recap, we have placement uh, in hospitals, orphanages, schools, uh, women's empowerment groups, uh, grassroots organizations. There's a ton of different things to do, a lot of diversity. So I think people with different uh, skill sets, different interests, they can really find something that they're going to be interested in and make a nice impact when they're in country. Uh, the next slide I'm going to talk about the CCS home base. Uh, so the home base is in Rabat. It's in a residential part of the community. Uh, it's in a nice walkable community. I really enjoyed that. Uh, to get to some area of the town, you take a cab and everything, but those nights where you just didn't feel like taking a cab or you didn't feel like dealing with the crowds in the Medina or anything like that, uh, you still had a lot to do. There's still a lot of different parks you can walk to, shopping centers you can walk to. There's like a row of restaurants and cafes you can walk to. So that was one of the best things I thought about the home base was its location. It's a great location. Um, the lodging is safe, uh, cozy, and colorful. Uh, it has these beautiful gardens. Uh, something about the soil, I guess, in Rabat and the, the atmosphere. It's just really easy to grow plants, I guess, because you see gardens trees and flowers everywhere. So uh, it was just really nice to walk around the, the courtyard around the home base. Uh, you have a resource center there. So that's where I'm getting all the arts and crafts materials and stuff for my placement at the Children's Hospital. Uh, we get it all from the home base. And that's uh, included in the program is all those resources. Uh, your meals are all at the volunteer home base. Uh, you get three meals a day. It's all Moroccan cuisine. So that's going to be one of the highlights of your trip. It's all that delicious food. Uh, uh, in the, I forgot what they're called, the tangines? Yeah, tangines. Yeah. Tangines. Go to the yeah. next slide because I think we have a picture of some of the food. It's just by far a big highlight, yeah. yeah. 
awesome to jeans, which are like basically a stew. Uh, and really, I'm not a big fan of food in general. Uh, it's not one of my top priorities, but the food there <laughs> it was great. I couldn't wait for lunch and dinner. And, uh, and the staff did a great job. I was there over Thanksgiving, so they actually went out and got a turkey for us and oh, cooked it Moroccan style for Thanksgiving. So just those little touches was a lot of fun. Um, back to the previous slide, transportation, that's going to include airport pickup uh, and drop-off. And then every day our vans are going to take you to and from your volunteer placement. So you're not going to have to worry about getting a cab and getting there on time. And the other important thing about that is that also helps our partner program. So if you're teaching in a school, they know you're going to arrive on time every day. If you're at the hospital, they know you're going to be there at the same time every day. And then they know that you're going to be picked up every day. So uh, not only is it a convenience for you, but it's also helping take a burden off our partner programs because there's some times where you, even if you have great intentions, you end up inconveniencing people. If you're late or if you don't have a ride, you need one of them to give you a ride or something like that. So we take that completely out of the equation. We take care of all that transportation for you. And then lastly, uh, communication. People are going to want to talk home and let everyone at home know about their adventures and that they're having fun and everything's all right. So there's Wi-Fi in the home base so people can email and Skype and do all that stuff. And then there's also uh, phones. They can accept incoming calls, and then uh, you can make outgoing calls with phone cards and things like that. Uh, and then just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, that's the front door to the home base in the top right. Uh, and then bottom right is the resource center stocked with books and games and arts and crafts stuff. So there's all kinds of stuff there. And then the bottom left is a couple of flowers. <laughs> um, so then this slide is just some more pictures. Uh, the top left is just the meeting area, so that's where people will hang out. That's where everyone eats. Uh, you'll see their circular tables with those poofs around them, which is really typical. You're going to find that a lot in Morocco. And then around the edges of the of that room is just this super long L-shaped couch. It actually is a U-shaped. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it actually keeps going. Uh, you can't see that in the picture. So it's just a great place to lounge around, and a lot of the volunteers end up congregating there. It's super comfortable. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite things about the home base is how social and collaborative it really is. I mean, living with other volunteers, you know, it's a nice, like, you know, because you have other people to go through the program with and have fun with and, you'll, you know, become friends with them. But it also sees, serves a really important role in your volunteer work um, because you'll probably be working with another volunteer at your volunteer placement, or even if you're not, there's similar types of placements that you'll be working in. Um, so, you know, having the resource center at your fingertips, having our staff um, to bounce ideas off of and having each other to say, oh, hey, yeah, last year at summer camp I planned this activity for the kids and it was really engaging. Let's try it at our placement here. So um, that's one of my favorite things about the home base. Well, and it's nice, too, because like I said before, I was a volunteer at the children's hospital doing arts and crafts activities. And after day three, like, oh, I think they're getting tired of making beaded bracelets. It's like, <laughs> I need more ideas. So I had other volunteers there. Say, oh, try this, try this, or, you know, uh, I have a niece and nephew, they love doing this activity, or I had someone else say, oh, I'm at a school and we just did this. So it was nice to kind of bounce ideas off people around dinner time and just to get some more ideas, because there's sometimes I was kind of stuck. It's like, I'm just doing the same thing every day. So uh, it's just nice to have that support of your fellow volunteers and the Native Country staff as well. Um, bottom left, that's the CCS van, so that's what's going to take you around. Uh, and then bottom right is uh, just the yard. Uh, with some volunteers hanging out. If it looks beautiful in the picture, it looks 10 times more beautiful in person. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Morocco is just an incredible place to go. Uh, the air is all soft. and it, Yeah, it feels like California, basically. Yeah. And there's lots around the neighborhood of the home base. There's, I don't know if you mentioned this before, uh, but there's like a pharmacy and um, you know things you can walk to. And I also went running um, almost every day in the afternoon. So if you're a runner or um, you know, want to do something like that, it, there's a park that's about a two-mile run or walk away. So, um, you know, really, really social neighborhood. Yeah, people ask me that a lot, actually. Like, can you go jogging? Can you go running? And this program is really jogger-friendly. Yeah. So if that's something that you like to do, definitely think about robots. Um, okay, the next slide, I'm going to talk about the staff. And so for me, this is the highlight of CCS programs worldwide, Absolutely. the in-country staff. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned before, in-country staff, they're all local people from the community. They're experts on the community. And they just love where they're from. And they can't wait to welcome you and uh, kind of show off their country a little bit. And uh, 
they're there year round, and I think that's huge because they're making the relationships with uh, the different partner programs and countries. So even though you're only there for a week or two weeks or two months or whatever, uh, you're part of something bigger. You're basically like a link in the chain. So uh, even though you're only there for a short amount of time, you're part of a year round uh, impact. So I really enjoy that. Uh, the top right picture is Mohammed, who is our country director. Uh, Mohammed comes from years of experience working with uh, international volunteers. Uh, before CCS, he worked for the Peace Corps. He was actually in charge of uh, their safety and security. So uh, we're lucky that we got him. We love having him on our staff, and he's incredible. So, uh, and he's also just a fun guy to be around. He always wants to hang out with the volunteers and talk to them. He leads a lot of the different discussions about uh, the history of Morocco and the religion in Morocco. So he just loves his job and loves being around volunteers, and uh, it really shows. Uh, the, the bottom left picture is, uh, is I can't say it. Khadija. Khadija? Yeah, Khadija um, and Abdullah and Mohammed. They're, I highlighted them on this slide because they're really, they're the program managers, Khadija and Abdullah um, are just, so phenomenal. They also came to us from the Peace Corps. Um, they were language and cultural trainers. Um, and so, again, really top-notch people. I mean, we couldn't have more qualified staff. Um, and uh, Khadija actually lives in the home base, so she becomes such a, a great friend and um, you know, companion while you're there. And Abdullah is really in charge of um, you know, helping you with your placements and knowing the partner programs and being sure that we're getting feedback from our partner programs. Um, so he's really great to engage with, too. Yeah. He also took us on a city tour. Mm -hmm. He took us to some ruins and stuff. He's a great tour guide as well. Uh, I guess it, it is part-time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Khadija, she, uh, she did henna on all the girls' hands and everything. So it's just a lot of fun. It's like a family atmosphere. Uh, it, it was really fun to be around. Um, then they're also on the staff, there's going to be cooks and housekeepers and licensed CCS drivers. So again, we're not just calling a cab for you or... Uh, putting you on a bus or something, these are CCS drivers. Uh, and then lastly, there's 24-hour security. So if there's any emergencies at night, if an appliance starts on fire, if you get really sick or something, there's always staff around. So it's not the type of deal where we have someone on a cell phone on the other side of town that you can call in case there's an emergency. That's not how it operates. The staff is actually right there. So if there's any emergencies or anything, you're always going to have support. Okay. All right, next slide, I'm going to talk about the culture and learning activities that are available. Like I said before, a big part of what we do is want you to learn everything about Morocco inside and out. Uh, so we want you to be there to volunteer, but also we want you to learn about their culture so you can really put everything into context. Uh, uh, guest speakers are a big part of uh, the cultural learning activities. So there will be an introduction to Islam, uh, talking about uh, women's rights in Morocco, and a lot more. And then sometimes if you have, uh, there isn't like a set list of topics, because a lot of times our volunteers will come to Mohammed and say, I'm really interested in this certain thing. And then he'll either give the talk himself, or he'll find someone who can give a lecture about that too. So uh, it's really flexible in that regard. Uh, cooking lessons. Uh, you see the picture on the left, that's Khadija giving a cooking lesson. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. So there they're cooking with the tajin. Uh, they also teach you how to make the mint tea and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then also if there's a dish that you really like, you can just go hang out with the cooks too. So every day can be a cooking lesson if you're interested yeah. in that. Uh, historical site visits, there's tons to see, so they take you all over uh, Rabat. Uh, you usually do that in your afternoon, maybe once or twice a week you're going to be taking those field trips uh, when you're done with your volunteer work. And then uh, we have language lessons. Uh, so the Arabic is, is a fun language to learn and the script is even more fun. I found it frustrating, but Claire, you said you thought oh, I it loved it. I mean, I can see how it could be frustrating, but my brain was just thinking in a totally different way, and I, I loved it because um, Arabic is written from right to left. Um, so putting together, like learning the like script letters and then trying to remember the sounds of them and then reading it from right to left. I only have one lesson, and I wanted to, like, day and have Abdullah teach me for another two hours. It was so fun. But it was exhausting. <laughs> it's, just a lot, it's a lot of like different thinking. Yeah. When they started going right to left, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, this is just a bonus. You're probably not going to become fluent in Arabic script and be able to read Harry Potter, like one of the volunteers purchased Harry Potter in, in Arabic script. Um, but 
it's like, you know, you can start to recognize some signs and letters and sounds and things. So I found even in one week with Moroccan Arabic, you know, I learned how to give kids instructions like sit down and listen and, um, you know, share and those kinds of, you know, helpful words for placement. Um, but I also learned some really fun phrases like mashimushki means no worries or no problem. And so as I was traveling on the weekend, I could use that and I heard it everywhere. So it really it becomes a quick quick thing that you can pick up. No, and that's the key uh, that's what Claire was hitting on. Is you're not going to become fluent, but we definitely want you to learn some phrases that are going to be useful uh, when you're in your community and at your volunteer placement. So uh, that's one of the nice things about the language lessons. They're kind of interactive. So if you if you have something at your place where you want to be able to tell someone to do a specific thing, you can ask of the staff, how do you say, uh, you know, sweep the floor? Or how do you say sit down? How do you say stop biting him? Or whatever. <laughs> so uh, they, they can help you out with that. And uh, I just learned numbers. And th that was useful, too, because we were playing. We had this basketball hoop, and we were playing a game, and whoever made the most hoops won. So after every round, you'd, everyone would kind of count off how many points they had. And, You'd have to count it in Arabic, French, and English for it to count. Oh, cool! That's yeah. amazing. I don't know how. Yeah, it was a pretty. I think my wife Lee. I think she <laughs> thought of that. I like to take credit for it, but yeah, it turned out pretty well. All right, uh, and then lastly, free time. So your evenings uh, and then your weekends are going to be free time. Uh, so. Uh, in Rabat, that means you can go to the Medina. The Medina is a cab right away. If you don't know what a Medina is, basically it's more of the old and ancient part of the city. In Rabat, you're going to have the modern uh, buildings and skyscrapers and stuff like that. But it's all centered around the soul of Rabat, which is the Medina. It's been there forever. And uh, it's the type of thing that you'd imagine. It's market and a lot of haggling, really crowded, a lot of windy streets that you might get lost. but. Uh, luckily, there's big entrances, so it's easy to find yourself if you do get lost. But a lot of people go there for shopping and to people watch and just to be part of the hustle and bustle. It's kind of why you go to Morocco to be part of that experience. For me, I experienced it about twice and that was good. But for other people, they're going there like every single night to the Medina. Uh, the hammam, I didn't go to, but Claire did. Yeah, so the hammam is the traditional Moroccan bath. And um, they have different hours. Usually it's different hours for men and women. Sometimes it's actually different facilities. But I think most places it's different days and hours. So um, as a woman, it was really phenomenal to have that kind of cultural experience. Um, you know, in a country where you know, some women do choose to um, wear the veil, um, not usually to cover their faces, but to cover their heads. And you know, a lot of people cover their elbows or to their wrists. And, um, you know, so, and often women are in the public sphere, um, in Morocco certainly, um, in Rabat especially, there's a lot of professional women, and um, there's a lot of universities and medical schools in Rabat, so you see a lot of young women out and about. Um, so it's not like, you know, you don't see women, but it was a different, um, you know, because it's a women-only space. You just had a different feel, and um, it was very, you know, interesting to see, and the hammam is awesome. You get like scrubbed to perfection. I was felt like I was like sparkling after I came out. Um, so really cool. And I think most volunteers go every week once they've kind of um, you know got got the initial visit done. They realize how amazing it is, and they'll go every week. I wanted to go every week. Awesome. Uh, I know that was super popular with the volunteers, but I just the idea they, they scrub your skin. And they scrub all the dead skin off and everything. Just kind of made my skin crawl. Yeah, like, yeah it's not, not for everybody. Yeah, I was, yeah. But yeah, people love it. And then they, what they end up doing is they end up finding uh, the equivalent back at home. So they'll go back mm -hmm. to the U.S. or Canada or U.K. or wherever they're from, and uh, they'll find a spa that does the same thing uh, back home. So I, I would think that's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, other things to do in Rabat. A lot of cafes around. There's a big French influence. So you'll see it's like street cafes. People drinking. Uh, cappuccinos or coffees or whatever. Having a croissant. Exactly. <laughs> so you're using your French. Good. Yeah. Uh, so you'll see that quite a bit. Uh, the school uh, where the one volunteer was teaching a bunch of college age students, they were always inviting them out after class. They're like, oh, come hang out with us, drink coffee with us. You know, it's just a really social thing to do. They're all these outdoor cafes, and you just kind of sit there for hours drinking tea and coffee and stuff like that. So uh, that's a big thing to do there. 
And then there's a, a lot of festivals. I wasn't there for any festivals, but I've been told there are some. Yeah, I was there for a music festival, so there are a lot of different international artists. Actually, Mariah Carey was there. She was? Nice. <laughs> and I was there. Um, but there were a lot of, like, Turkish artists, Moroccan artists, and, you know, different kinds of um, musicians. So, um, yeah, because we're about the capital. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of theater and events. Um, you know, pretty much something for everybody. Yep. So that's stuff that you can do, uh, you know, in your free time in the evening or if you stay in Rabat for a weekend. But a lot of people on their weekend, they want to get out of town and go see other parts of Morocco. And this is something we really encourage and really want to have our volunteers do because it's so easy to get around Morocco. There's trains, uh, buses. It's just really easy to get around. Uh, imperial cities that are pretty big for people to visit or Fez, Meknes and Marrakesh, uh, you can get to these places by train. It's super convenient. Even if you're like a first-time traveler, it's pretty difficult to mess it up. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, there'll be cab drivers waiting at the train to pick you up and take you to your hotel and everything. It's really, really easy. Uh, that's what uh, my wife and I did. We went to Fez and then to the desert and to Marrakesh and we stopped and Where's that? Yeah, I, I skipped it on purpose because I can never say it correctly. <laughs> yeah, it's just so easy to get around. So you can do this stuff on weekend trips and things like that. Uh, we even have some volunteers go up to Spain on the weekend. Um, you can go to the Canary Islands if you want to. Yeah, I mean, those definitely would be like a lot of traveling um, versus time relaxing. So yeah. you have to kind of decide which way you go on that because, you know, it is far. But if you want to go after your program, I think that's especially easy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I went to Casablanca, which is just an hour and a half away on an afternoon, um, and we went to see this huge mosque. Um, it's the biggest mosque in Morocco, and I think it actually might be one of the highest minarets in the world. Yeah. Um, and it was spectacular. I think they can hold, like, 30,000 people on the grounds of the um, mosque, so really beautiful architecture and... Um, yeah, the desert was cool. I think that's on a lot of people's bucket list of riding the camels. It's, again, a far trek from Rabat because, you know, it's completely different sides of the country, but definitely worth it to do it um, and, and, you know, travel for, for a while and, and, you know, volunteers do that together. So the volunteers I was going with um, all did the desert the first weekend. Um, so they got together and planned it, and then they had a private bus that they all split. It's really easy to do. Yeah, I, we did the desert as well. You know, you take a camel out there, you camp under the stars. It's a pretty cool weekend, definitely. Yeah. Um, the top right picture are the leather tanneries. I assume that's in Fez. Yes. Um, so Fez, uh, their Medina is the largest one possibly in the world. It is one of the oldest cities in the world. You know, you get some tour guides, they claim it's the first city in the world. <laughs> you know, you never know what to believe, but it's really, really old and really, really big. Uh, they actually don't recommend walking around there yourself because you can get really lost there. So most people will hire a guide, and that's what we did. And it's actually better because they can take you straight to a lot of points of interest and everything. And if there's a specific thing you want to buy, they can take you to the best shop for that. And uh, That was a lot of fun. So that top right is the tannery. Uh, the only bad thing about it is it really smells <laughs> because you're dealing with rawhide, I don't yeah. know, whatever they use leather, to make leather. Yeah. So, uh, that was the only bad thing about that, it was the smell. Uh, they actually give you a twig of mint to put under your nose while you're shopping around for different leather goods. Yeah, that's pretty funny. That was pretty funny. Uh, bottom left is just uh, some young people hanging out at the beach. Uh, one thing about Morocco, though, is they get a wide variety of different ages of volunteers. Uh, so I know that picture is just looks like a bunch of hip college kids. <laughs> but uh, we actually get a, more than our other programs the wide mix. Uh, we still get a lot of uh, college kids who are adventurous and want to see that part of the world, but we also have other people who have been thinking about going to Morocco their whole lives. Maybe they saw the movie Casablanca and have been always intrigued by it. Uh, the Arab world is always in the news. We have a lot of people who want to go to that part of the world to check it out, and Morocco is probably the safest place to go in the Arab world. So you have a lot of people with different uh, motivations of going there. I was actually with one volunteer. Uh, she was looking up Moroccan rugs, and uh, somehow in her web search, Cross Cultural Solutions came up, and oh, wow. she's like, "What's this?" And so she's like, "Oh, so she's looking for rugs, and then volunteering with us." So wow. you just never know, but it definitely attracts just such a wide variety of people.
Okay. Uh, any other comments? No, on I think free that's time? it. I mean, obviously, it's a great adventurous place to travel, or you know, you can be you know staying in Rabat and doing things on your weekend too, or going to the cities. Um, but obviously, you know, the core of the experience is the volunteer experience, the cultural immersion. But definitely love when people get out and explore um, the community on their own and kind of try those Arabic phrases on the weekend. Okay. So our next slide we want to talk about is the uh, enrollment process and the pre-departure support. So basically from start to finish, uh, you're going to have the support of the CCS staff. So uh, all of the HQ staff here in uh, New Rochelle, New York, we're all alumni of the program. We've all done these programs before, so we can definitely help you with any questions you have. If you're trying to choose between program sites and everything, uh, that's when you talk to us. Uh, you talk to Claire. Uh, or me, or anyone else on the program advisors team, uh, we're here to help you decide between those dates and uh, help you decide what program is the best fit for you. Uh, once you enroll in a program, so once you've confirmed your date and everything, and you uh, and you're ready to go to Morocco or one of our other countries, then you'll speak with the program site specialist for that specific site. So Morocco has their own specialist who only uh, deals with enrolled volunteers and their main focus is to help you get prepared to go in country. So they're based out of our headquarters here in New Rochelle, and they basically serve as the go-between between you and our Morocco staff. So that way, if you have questions about your volunteer placement or something like that, you don't have to call uh, Morocco uh, to figure that out. Or if you have like a food allergy or uh, another type of concern, you can just tell us here, and we can go ahead and pour that information onto our staff in Morocco, and you don't have to worry about long-distance phone calls or anything like that. Uh, after you arrive in country, uh, you have the in country support. So again, that's a highlight of your trip uh, with the CCS program is that in country staff are there to find your volunteer placement, to lead the different cultural and learning activities, to take you to your placement every day. They're a big part uh, of what we do. And then lastly, uh, so after you come back, uh, we have the alumni action network. So uh, really, we want people to be lifelong learners uh, about international issues. So uh, there's newsletters and uh, different ways to stay involved, uh, ways to spread the word about CCS, go on another program. Uh, a lot of people will also be inspired to do some volunteer work domestically after they've done this, so we'll offer different suggestions of ways to do that. So there's a lot to the Alumni Action Network after you've returned home. Okay, so that is the gist of it. Uh, so at this point, we want to open up the floor to any questions that came in. Uh, Claire, was there any questions in the chat? Yeah, I know that a number of people asked this um, before the webinar today, but maybe we can touch a little bit on safety. Mm -hmm. um, and while we're talking through um, the first question, um, definitely feel free to give me those um, you know, questions in the chat, and we can you know, visit them with the whole group. Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about safety and what CCS um, keeps in mind for volunteer safety and you know, what it's like traveling in Morocco. Yeah, so the first thing about Morocco is it's an incredibly safe country. Uh, we wouldn't operate programs in countries where we felt were unsafe for volunteers, uh, and we wouldn't be in communities that we felt were unsafe. So uh, it's not an accident that we're in the specific community in Rabat that we're located. We're located there because it's very safe, and then it's also close to all of our different volunteer placements. Uh, having Mohammed as our country director is incredible, considering his background as the safety and security uh, director of the Peace Corps. Uh, so that's kind of his background. Uh, we have that 24-hour security in case any emergencies did come up. And uh, like I said before, it, the staff is there 24-7. So it's not some guy on a cell phone on the other side of town or a call center that you get or anything like that. Uh, the staff is there to support you. Uh, other things we keep in mind is uh, all of our meals are prepared in the home base. So you're not going to have to worry about getting sick from the food or anything like that. If you have dietary restrictions, food allergies, uh, that's okay. We can definitely accommodate you. That's not a problem at all. If you have other health issues, like if you have medicine that needs to be refrigerated, or if you uh, are on some sort of machine that needs to stay running at night, you know these are things that you can you know make us aware of, and uh, we can definitely help you out with that too. So uh, we want to make sure you're having a comfortable time because at the end of the day, if you're going for two or three weeks and you spend half that time in bed with like a stomach flu, that's a waste of time for everyone involved. So we don't want that to happen. We want you focused specifically on your volunteer work and, and feeling safe. As far as traveling around, uh, as you have seen by the pictures, I'm actually 
really tough looking, so for me it wasn't <laughs> a problem. <laughs> but Claire, I think you can handle that better because I get asked that a lot actually uh, yeah. from, from a lot of female volunteers. Uh, they're like, what's my safety going to be like in Morocco? So I think yeah. you probably need to sit on that a little bit better. Absolutely. Maybe. Yeah, I always felt super comfortable um, in Morocco. Um, I actually traveled alone to Casablanca to the mosque um, to check that out. Um, and um, also a little bit, you know, around other, but it was the mom alone, so I was out in Rabat a little bit alone. Yeah, and you definitely, I mean, feel super confident and safe, and um, people in Morocco are really generous, hospitable people, um, so if anything, you might get a little bit more attention than you're used to, so that can sometimes feel a little bit strange for people, maybe from New York or something where they're not used to people, you know, approaching them to have a conversation or, you know, asking questions, so that can sometimes feel a little different. It's not, you know, that people are, um, you know, meaning you harm or anything. Um, but definitely the staff will give you some guidelines in order to, you know, keep yourself um, as safe as possible and just kind of prevent any situations that could become, uh, you know, uncomfortable for you. So like, you know, women um, not, well, and anybody in general not going out alone um, in the evening, um, you know, to, um, you know, even, by cab, you know, it's, it's, you know, good to be with a group, um, you know, when you're after dark. Um, you know, be, mostly because Moroccans aren't really out um, after dinner, um, you know, like after 10 p.m. Moroccans eat dinner really late. Um, so you wouldn't really see anybody that, you know, kind of moving around the community um, at that point that, you know, maybe is um, not up to, <laughs> uh, you know, shenanigans. Um, but then, you know, traveling throughout the country, I mean, it's a great idea to be with other people, but um, you definitely can, you know, feel confident about um, traveling on your own. A lot of times there are, you know, first class cars in trains that aren't that much more expensive that just mean that you get a reserved seat so you're not kind of jostling with other people that might be a little bit, you know, more uncomfortable to do. But, um, yeah, I know a lot of people that have kind of traveled in groups of women or small groups and never had any problems at all. Um, we did get a question from the audience about um, what type of clothing is acceptable for women to wear in Morocco, and that's a great question kind of on the same vein. Um, because if you dress like Moroccan women, you're not going to get as much attention as you might if you're, you know, kind of not wearing things that other women in Morocco wear. So um, really in Morocco that just means, uh, you know, having some kind of sleeve on your shirt. Um, and wearing something that goes below the knee, so um, capris or jeans or longer skirts, um, short sleeves, long sleeves. Um, at your volunteer placement, you're going to want to dress a little bit more conservatively. You know, if you're a teacher, you're going to be wearing something that looks a little more professional. You know, that um, you know is is conservatively dressed. You know, nothing low cut. Those kinds of things. Um, but you know, when you're moving out around in your free time, you know, definitely short sleeves is fine. Um, you'll see women wearing a, a whole range of things in Morocco. There'll be, like I said, people covering all the way to their wrists, and there'll be people wearing short sleeves. So um, it's really easy to dress uh, appropriately. And usually you want to bring, like, layers just to kind of gauge what your comfort level is and then kind of adjust from there. Yeah, and that was one thing that surprised me about Moroccan women is their dress was all over the board. Yeah. Uh, I thought everyone was going to be dressed in the full and everything, but that's not the case. Not it's the really case, a, yeah. just a personal decision based off of style, religion, just how they felt that day. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was thinking with some uh, women, and some days they just don't feel like brushing their hair, so they'll yeah. put something over their head. And, but then others, it's like every single day because of their religious beliefs. So it was all over the board. And uh, Morocco's a pretty progressive country, so yeah. um, it's not something that they're going to be persecuted for or anything like that. And uh, Kind of... Rabatho, just keep in mind, it's a big city, so when you're walking around a big city, just like anywhere else in the world, you're not going to want your camera dangling from your wrist, you're not going to be wanting to wear flashy jewelry or things like that. If you go to an ATM, you want to make sure you go with someone else, or yeah, you know, you're know, you aware of your surroundings when you do those types of things, but that's the same with anywhere you go in the world. So I think as long as you're making those good decisions, making sure you're with one or two other volunteers when you go out, uh, you're going to be fine. Great. So yeah, so our next question is about photography. Um, can you take pictures anywhere, or do you have to ask permission first? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, it's different from placement to placement, and that's something that your uh, that the in country staff is going to talk about uh, during your orientation. Is they're going to tell you what placement is appropriate to take pictures and what placement is not appropriate to take pictures. Uh, across the board, we tell our volunteers. 
to not bring their cameras with them the first day or two of their volunteer placement because you're still breaking the ice with people and to take pictures right away is kind of weird. But definitely at the end, you know, you built these great relationships, so you're going to want to take some photos. So uh, I volunteered in placements before where I was allowed to take pictures, but they were only for my personal use. Like I couldn't put the pictures up on the internet or something like that to uh, preserve uh, the animidity of the kids there. Uh, it's definitely uh, a pretty serious deal. So I know the orphanage placement actually in Morocco, no cameras at all uh, are allowed, um, and we respect that. Uh, but other places, there's other schools like uh, the school that Claire and I keep talking about where we teach English to uh, refugees. Oh, definitely you can bring your cameras there, and they want to pose for photos, and they want to make sure that you email it back so they put it on their Facebook page. So uh, it's just different from place to place. In the community, it's just like anywhere else where you can take pictures of buildings, anything you want to, but if you take a picture of an individual, it's always polite to ask for their permission. But that's the same as anywhere. Well, it looks like our questions might have slowed a little bit, and I know we're right at 5 o'clock. So um, if you need to drop off, definitely feel free to. We're happy to take a couple more questions here. We can stay on for a little bit. Um, but again, um, Pete, do you want to go to the next slide and just show the next step? Oh, yes. Yeah. Before we head out, um, so yeah, next steps are really to you know contact us or another program advisor if you want to learn more or want to talk about a start date that might work well with your schedule. Um, we really do recommend planning ahead, like Pete said, because Morocco fills quickly, particularly at holiday time. Um, so around Thanksgiving and um, New Year's and um, the Christmas and Hanukkah holidays, um, that'll fill really quickly. So definitely get in touch with us. Um, and stay in touch with us. We have a great Facebook page where people post blogs and um, you can engage with other volunteers and seeing what their experiences were um, and all the other social media routes as well as our own CCS community which is our own social networking site. Um, so you can create a profile there and engage with people that have um, traveled on CCS programs. Um, and then we also have upcoming information sessions in a lot of different places. You can just see June schedule there. Um, but we'll have lots more coming throughout the summer and the year. So um, you can sign up for our email list that will alert you if there's something in your area, or you can keep your eye on that events page. Oh, and we're on Pinterest. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> we're on it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, we just, I think we just launched that a couple of weeks ago. But, uh, yeah, I hear Pinterest is really addicting. I've tried to keep it at arm's length because I know I'll get sucked in. Yeah. Um, so... Oh, I'm always finding recipes on Pinterest. So. <laughs> well, it works out for you, huh? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Nice. Okay, great. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, engaging in the webinar today. Again, the recording will be posted um, in a couple days, or you can email Peter or I to get that um, sent to you directly in a couple days. All right. Thanks for sitting through our presentation, everyone. And just to you know, reiterate what Claire said, if you have any questions about Morocco, give us a call, shoot us an email. Uh, we love it. We've been there before, so uh, no question is too big or too small. So definitely let us know if there's anything we can do for you. And Morocco's awesome. <laughs> Go to Morocco. All right, thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks.